Avengers Age of Ultron is garbage, folks. Is it an alligator or a crocodile? I don't know the difference, and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. Look at that. That is a werewolf. <laughs> What is up, everyone? Welcome to Den of Geek Presents Marvel Stand Em Live, where each week we give you the deepest possible dives on all the goings on in the MCU, Marvel Comics, and beyond. I know I'm lying when I say each week because we just took a couple weeks off, but we're not going to talk about that right now because we are back. We're talking about Werewolf by Night. We're catching up on She-Hulk. It's going to be great. I am your host, Mike Cicchini, the editor-in-chief of denageek.com, and with me for all time and always... I've got Denny Geek TV editor Alec Bajalid, Denny Geek News and Features editor Kirsten Howard, and our special guest this we- this week is the all nerdy bastard himself, Task. You may know him from his brilliant MCU analysis and fandom on Twitter as at up to task, or as the host of the Super Suit Show. Uh, me, I'm just here for when you break down the Marvel solicitations every week, dude. Like every month. So like. <laughs> It's good to have you. Uh, good to be here. I am in black and white. That's awesome. <laughs> I think I think we might all be. This is oh, uh, you guys are all in black and white. Nice. <laughs> every week, Andrew manages to surprise us with a new bit of on-brand brilliance for the week. And since nice, we are kicking off this episode talking about Werewolf by Night. I think this is pretty appropriate. What do you say, folks? Should we just get right into it? We can. I just want to say I'm scared because there are two things against me right now. I am black and I'm in black and white. And this is horror. The, the step, it's not, (laughs) if I make it out of this alive, (laughs) I just want to thank the Academy. That's all I want to (laughs) say. We don't do well in black and white in horror. So those are two things against me. (laughs) You'll be the first to have technical difficulties on this episode. (laughs) I like that. It would both be shockingly impressive and an incredibly poor taste if Andrew just like animated a werewolf to attack you throughout this. So. <laughs> hey, listen, we got to follow tradition. I'm with you. <laughs> no, no, no. Not that kind of show. <laughs> Meanwhile, I just realized that the folks who are going to listen to this as a podcast on like Spotify and Apple and everywhere else after the fact are going to have no idea what we're talking about. Like, That's fine. They can watch it live. That's good promo. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Good reminder that these folks should be tuning in every, in every week. Tess, you, you do my job for me. Knock it oh, off. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start with Werewolf by Night. And before I start gushing about it, Kirsty, why don't you tell us how it all went, how it all went down? Okay. In Marvel's one-off Halloween special Werewolf by Night, a cabal of monster hunters are drawn together one dark and stormy night to compete for the late Ulysses Bloodstone's powerful blood gem relic. Encroaching on the proceedings are Jack Russell, a kind-hearted lycanthrope who wants to rescue his friend Ted, aka Man-Thing, from the chopping block, and Elsa Bloodstone, Ulysses' estranged daughter. Carnage ensues when the cabal forces Jack to turn into a werewolf, but he and Elsa eventually rescue Ted, and Elsa grabs the blood gem for herself. Anybody who's watched this show for a while uh, knows that I've been looking forward to this perhaps more than any other MCU, at least any other MCU TV project. Um, And just that I love werewolves in general. So I shouldn't be the one to kick this off. Task, what'd you think of Werewolf by Night? When they first announced that Marvel was going to be doing a Halloween special, they didn't say what character they were going to use. When they revealed they were going to do Werewolf by Night, the first thing I thought is why? (laughs) <laughs> I was like, well, this is cool. I'll take whatever you guys give me. But knowing how Kevin Feige is and how Marvel is, I kept thinking, why are we doing this? Why is this being done? Um, I think that this is um, Feige's way of trying to um, say, hey, we're going to try different things. We are going to take a chance and take a shot. Um, I, a lot of, um, of scoopers talked to me. And one of the things they asked me was, 
is Werewolf by Night usually in black and white, like the comic? <laughs> and I told them, I was like, I know usually, but that was the big rumor. So when I came into it, I was like, okay, how are they going to do this? How is this going to get done? So I came in thinking it wasn't going to be good. And I was blown away by it. Absolutely. Uh, very, very well done. Um, I hope they do more of them. Kirsty, you also had the added benefit of interviewing Michael Giacchino about this. Of course, it was before we had actually seen it. Yes, um, it was before still, I did. You got I'd some seen it. <laughs> into the production, yeah. Yeah, um, he really comes across as a great guy, very passionate about this. It clearly meant a lot to him. I think uh, Ken Feige had asked him what he wanted to do, and he immediately said Werewolf by Night. And I think Feige had the same reaction as Task. It was like, why <laughs> you know yeah. of all the things you could do werewolf by night's the one really um but yeah you can see it's just he he has put so much love into this and it's just it's just a massive dub like all the way through the visuals are great there's there's stuff here that we just haven't seen in the mc before someone that's clearly got a vision and it's just tight, purposeful, leaves you wanting more. It's actually what I would consider to be a pretty much perfect uh, Disney Plus project for Marvel. And it's turned out incredible, I think. Allie. Yeah, I, I also think it's virtually perfect. I don't share Mike's love for werewolves. Like, I don't really, it's not, I don't know, I guess I've been more of a vampire man myself this whole time. But this is wonderful. Uh, and really part of the big appeal is that it's only 50 minutes long. This is the kind of stuff that I had always hoped that we would get when Disney Plus was announced as a streamer. Because a lot of the stuff that's come to Disney Plus have, been, have felt perfunctory here and there. Like we have to fulfill a contractual need to have this character here. But this time around, it's just like, guy has an idea he loves. Ask Kevin Feige to do the thing and do it <laughs> with a very distinct visual style. And Feige says, all right, I mean, the streaming world is infinite. Like, you have 50 minutes and here's some cash and go do it. Uh, it just, and it, you can really feel the love behind it. Virtually no complaints. I don't have any complaints for anything that's 50 minutes long. Like, I, I, would, like, I would watch virtually anything if it was under an hour. <laughs> So I do, like, I've always been a werewolf guy. I don't know why. Like, I did have an insufferable vampire phase when I was a teenager, but that's a, that's a conversation for another time. Um, but I love Marvel's 70s horror stuff. Like, like, Tomb of Dracula is a fantastic book. And, like, that's usually held up as kind of the ultimate of the Marvel horror stuff of that era. But Werewolf by Night is a cool comic as well. And Task, it's funny that people were asking, like, is Werewolf by Night usually in black and white? And the answer is, of course, no. But the way that I read most Werewolf by Night comics is Marvel used to put out these, like, phone book-sized cheap reprints. The Omnibus Essentials. The Omnibus? Yeah. They have a, a Marvel horror Omnibus. Um, in the 70s, Marvel really dug into... The um, <clears throat> they were basically doing whatever's popular on TV. That's why we got characters like Luke Cage because black exploitation was big at the time. That's why we got characters like Iron Fist because that was when American Western cinema was first discovering like, oh, we have a uh, Mount Martial Arts movie. So Marvel was really big on doing whatever is popular on TV and whatever is popular. I mean, they even gave Kiss a comic. So at the time, <laughs> they had numerous comic books. There's numerous kids comic books. There's one where they beat up Dr. Doom. It's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, so they were like, okay, horror is really getting into their stride. So they decided to do a whole like run of just Marvel monsters. There was basically, like he said, Dracula. There was Werewolf by Night. There was Living Mummy. Um, there were others too. And they even formed a group called the Legion of Monsters. And it looks to me like there's some Legion of Monsters stuff in this as well. Absolutely. If anybody can track down, I don't know if these are expensive now, but like they used to be super cheap. But like if you can get like the essential Werewolf by Night volumes, there's only two of them and it reprints the whole 70s run and they're like this thick. And those are in black and white and they kick ass. Right. And like the early issues are drawn by Mike Plug, So like it's just really, really deep cool stuff and like 
it's one of those characters though that generally speaking it's kind of like cooler in concept than it is in execution especially over like years and years of comic storytelling but this special just nailed it like it went exactly the right way it's like we don't need an origin story everybody knows what every werewolf origin story is right like (laughs) and it's like we're just going to assume that people are familiar enough with the tropes of the genre and we're going to lean into other stuff and to me this feels like the kind of thing that feige has been promising for a long time you know for years marvel's been like oh yeah you know not all our stuff is superhero movies some of it is like you know, again, I always use the Winter Soldier example, which is like, oh, it's a spy thriller that happens to have Captain America in it. And it's like, okay, that's true for, you know, 60% of the movie, right? But like, ultimately, it always kind of comes back to what it is. This one doesn't. Like, this one totally fulfills that mission statement. It looks so awesome. I love all the practical effects. I could not be happier with it. This is probably, probably my favorite Marvel thing of the year so far. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's I'm a so happy thing. they came through for you because I, I was just thinking of you the whole time. <laughs> I would have been heartbroken. <laughs> well, because the other thing is, like, correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Like, werewolves are not as like are not as cool or like just like not as in the public eye as like other horror elements. Like, for example, like we're putting together an awesome like you know best werewolf movies thing for DenGeek.com right now, and like outside of the ones like you really know like there's not a lot of like deep werewolf cuts that are, that are all that essential, you know? So for something to come and do something new with that concept and expose it to an audience as wide as what the MCU has, I think it's really cool. And I'm just thrilled that Michael Giacchino, a first time director was allowed to do whatever the hell he wanted with this. Absolutely. You know, there's a narrative that keeps getting pushed that, um, Marvel doesn't allow directors to have their own creative freedom. Well, I mean, that argument is becoming less and less more in phase four, if you ask me, because whether you like, for example, whether you like the Eternals or not, the fact that, you know, Feige gave a chance for that to be made and not just the chance for that to be made. What people also forget, this is the number one franchise ever in existence. So for them to say, you know what, let's do something different. Let's completely do something completely different is a bold move, especially with someone who's never directed before. Like he he's the Batman composer. <laughs> <laughs> That's that that to me is crazier than my first time directing. Also, I've never done it before. I'm a composer. Like, so I appreciate that more. But it that that argument's coming less and less. I really, really appreciated where they went with this because they didn't have to go that route with it. You're right. And I do think, look, for a very long time, it did. There was very much a Marvel directorial house style. You know, there were all those reports of, you know, directors, especially in phase two, where it's like they were kind of getting stepped on. That certainly ended with Ryan Coogler. And it certainly ended with, you know, Taika Waititi. And, you know, we've seen this year, I mean, like Sam Raimi certainly was allowed to make a Sam Raimi movie with, with Dr. Strange. So maybe maybe that's changing i mean one thing that their competition has done really well like when you watch you know the movies aside i mean like warner brothers definitely lets their directors like put their stamp on their movies in ways that until recently marvel wasn't quite as willing to do this is the change i um my only regret with werewolf by night is that i didn't get a chance to see it on a big screen because this would be a lot of fun in a movie theater i've watched it twice I'll probably watch it again on Halloween night. I'm pretty into this. You see what you just did there? You just said, I'm going to watch it again on Halloween night. That goes back to my question when I first, when you first talked to me on here and I said, why was this made? Why? I, I think I tend to think more like beyond and I, that I came to a conclusion. One of the number one merch sellers in the world is during Halloween time. Mm-hmm. And people mm-hmm. will set up rituals and things they do simply for Halloween. For example, I said, well, on Halloween, I'll probably watch it again. There you go. So basically what Disney and Marvel has done is they say, oh, you like horror? We got that too, even in the MCU. I mean, look at Avengers Campus. They already got a werewolf by night there and an Elsa Bloodstone. Like the show, it just came out. 
And they're already like establishing, yes, this is Marvel. So during yeah. the Halloween time, they don't have to like do things like, hey, this is Captain America and a sombrero or something like that. <laughs> well, just bring out the wolf. <laughs> just, just bring out the wolf, bring out the zombies. We're good to go. So that's that would make my opinion of that. <laughs> I think the, uh, the werewolf by night at Avengers Campus looks as good or better as the werewolf in this. 100. <laughs> it looks so good. I appreciate that they went the practical effects route for so much of this Wolfie there. Uh, even man thing was at least partially practical, which I think was great. Excuse um, me, sir. Uh, he goes by Ted. Ted, yeah. Sorry. We, we yeah. respect what we want to be called here. He, he, yeah. he's, Ted. he's an old friend. <laughs> uh, so what, what did everybody else think of the look of this? Um, there were a lot of things, a lot of things I respected. Uh, I love the actor that they got for uh, Werewolf by Night. If you guys haven't been noticing in Hollywood in general, especially DC, uh, Marvel and even on the DC side, um, <clears throat> there has been a voice that has been very quiet that we need more of. And one of that is, and what that is, is the Latino. Um, there are a lot of great characters that are of the Latino variety that you know, deserve to get their shine. And I found it great that they cast a Latina led act for it. So that is something that could be added there. And then we have a Tanak coming over from Namor. So there's a shift that's going to start happening where a lot of, um, you know, of Latin America, a lot of, uh, of the people from uh, South America, from Mexico and all Latinas all over the world, um, they're going to get a lot more representation. Um, and they got him who is like a legendary actor. So like, they're not just getting like small people. They're getting pretty big names on there. And so I really appreciated that. One complaint I do have is Jack Russell. Um, he had paint on his face. It was like white paint. And uh, I remember the guy even brought it up. Yes, exactly. I wish that I could have learned more about that. He braced on it a little bit. He talked about it a little bit, but I just wish I had more of that. But other than that, um, I hope maybe this is a chance that they can explain that in a future show um, or a future thing. Um, Ted Manthing killed it. Um, I got a very Han Solo chewy vibe from these two. Uh, I, you know, you know, the Han Solo chewy vibe, or maybe in this case, Rocket and Groot. <laughs> <laughs> the day that Ted and Groot meet is going to be amazing. Like I need them to speak. I feel like they will be best friends. Like I don't know why. <laughs> like maybe because they're plant based. I don't know. But uh, yeah, um, I can't wait for them to the meet. And uh, I just hope that the stories between Jack and Ted continue. Kirsty, you spoke to Michael about some of this. Do you have That's any it. insights about man? Well, yeah, just about and 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 about the approach to 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 Ted, to Jack, uh, to the visuals in general. Yeah, I mean, he told me that it was important to embrace as many practical effects and traditional styles as possible. He insisted on having a traditional set there. He wanted uh, people to be able to react to things, not like just green screen or a tennis ball on a stick. Like it was, it was really important to him that um, this felt like it was really happening, that it was physical. Um, so I, I think he pulled it off. I know they did use some CG, uh, I guess, for Ted. Otherwise, it seems to be quite practical. And um, he also spoke to me about his fondness for the sort of Roger Corman approach of like, you know, here's a little bit of money. You got two weeks, make me a movie. And I, I think he threw himself into that, you know, he leaned into it. And um, he also told me that, you know, when he was uh, finished filming it, he was still thinking about it. And it, even when it had wrapped and they they closed it off, he was thinking, you know, well, we could have edited it like this. And so he was so passionate about it that he was still thinking about it pretty much, you know, um, to all the way to the time it started streaming. So, yeah, he um, he really did come off um, like a really great guy. So, yeah, I'm just I'm really pleased for him because because this uh, this turned out so good. I'm happy to hear that. Michael Michael Giacchino is like low key one of the most important people in pop culture to me. I don't yes. know if I realized it until this <laughs> this thing. Like the Lost sound, like ninety five, like Lost is like Star Wars, where like ninety five percent of the reason ended up iconic is because of the soundtrack. 
and then he did up in Ratatouille. He's just a, the man's a genius. Um, he, he told me that Lost was one of um, or his most favorite thing that he's worked on in terms of like composing. For me, it was also like the Doctor Strange soundtrack that he did was the first soundtrack I felt like really stood out uh, for the MCU movies. I could I could sense that there was um, that he wanted to do more. So I'm really not surprised to see him like heading up a project here because there was just an extra layer of attention that was going into his work for the MCU. He's only a, a T short of an EGOT right now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So we have to brainstorm what kind of uh, musicals we can get him involved in. To address Mike's question about the visuals, uh, I think Ted is... A masterpiece. The general consensus that he is the best part of the special, and I absolutely can't argue with that. Just whatever combination of practical and CGI they used was utterly marvelous. He, he is so emotive, so cute, uh, so funny, so imposing still. Um, this whole special in general, but Ted in particular, like made me finally get like what Guillermo del Toro's life has been like throughout these, like, <laughs> like it made me understand like why people love monsters. Um, and he was just great, man. I love Ted. It's such, a, such an incredible technical and artistic achievement. And if you guys noticed, um, <clears throat> I haven't seen one person complain about the CGI in this. No. Um, I was scared for the man thing. <laughs> okay i was scared i was like okay uh how are we gonna do this i'm hoping because that has been a big talking point so i was like i hope that they pull it off and so far yeah uh we could all agree ted's probably the most popular part of the show i think we will be seeing more of ted i'm hoping you know Howard the Duck's first ever appearance was in a Ted comic was in a man thing comic <laughs> like, I, like I really you know like I've been like I've been like waiting for Howard to pop up on She-Hulk or something you know what I mean so I'm hoping now that Ted is out there this is going to be some kind of excuse for them to bring Howard from wherever he is out in the Guardians of the Galaxy corner of the MCU uh, to Earth for some shenanigans in the near future he showed up in portals. He was exactly. there. He was exactly. There. You could just say he didn't go back. He's like, hey, I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I've only read like two man thing comics in my entire life. I, I've read, I've read Howard's first appearance. And I think I read the first ever comic. And this is something I know I should fix because it's, it's Steve Gerber. Like Steve Gerber created this character. You know what I mean? Like, like one of the most brilliant, subversive comics writers of a generation. And I haven't bothered reading this stuff, you know? And like, now that I've seen this show, it's like, what's the matter with me? You know? Like, <laughs> You're so problem? hard on yourself. There's so many comics. I know. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but only a limited number written by Steve Gerber, you know? So it's like, that's that's kind of my issue. But I'm, I'm so happy to see this character become a household name. Not going to lie, though, a little bit bummed that, as usual, Marvel comes in, does something that kind of steals DC's thunder a little bit. No TV show of the last like decade has been done more dirty than that amazing Swamp Thing TV show that was on DC Universe that was canceled before it even aired an episode. And that isn't even that they haven't even bothered putting on HBO Max. That show kicked so much ass. And like, you know, there's always been like the visual similarities between those two characters and of course the name similarities and once again, here, here's Marvel kind of just instantly overshadowing everything else. And God knows when I'm going to get to see that show again. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, real quick. Only, only Marvel DC superhero named Alec. Oh, yes. I think you're right. <laughs> Task, is there like, so Swamp Thing is Alec Holland. Can you think of a Marvel character with a first name of Alec? A lot of Alex, but no, uh, like Alec. Alec. Yeah. No, no. I think he. I think he's right. <laughs> I think it's it a chosen is chosen one. Big character that we haven't touched on yet, though, is Elsa. It's pretty significant that Elsa Bloodstone has just shown up in live action, played by somebody from Outlander. You know, like they're not messing around here, and 
full disclosure, another character that I've only read maybe a handful of appearances with. My only proper experience with the Bloodstone family is in a great Mark Grunewald Captain America run uh, called The Bloodstone Hunt from the late Bloodstone 80s. Hunt, yep. Like that was like the shit that like got me into Mark Grunewald. So like, um, but yeah, like what, what else can we, what else can we talk about with Elsa here? And now you've, it's time for you folks to educate me. As far as I know, she hasn't had a solo run, um, but I have read a lot of stuff with her in and she's terrific. Like, I think I read like Marvel Zombies. I read a, a Black Knight Curse of the Ebony Blade, which she's that great. really in. good. She, she tends to steal any comics she's in. Um, she recently had a romance with Deadpool which could be significant or might not be significant. Um, but she's just phenomenal. I can imagine her showing up um, in this Marvel Zombies animated series that's coming up on Disney+. Plus. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if she was, like, the lead character on that. Um, she was also, yeah, in, in the sort of battle world era of uh, Secret Wars. So um, she fits into this part uh, the, or the phase going into phase five and six of the MCU. She just slots right in. And Laura Donnelly is a great, terrific actress. Um, she is also somebody that steals every scene she's in, whatever show she's in. And um, I just thought she was phenomenal here. I know you guys all thought man thing was the best part of this, but I've got to go with Elsa. She, uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a great performance. A lot of stuff just written on her face that she didn't need to say out loud. And uh, yeah, just can't wait to see her again, honestly. That's that yeah. British bias, I could tell. That you got to <laughs> <laughs> like, forget all of them. <laughs> now, uh, Elsa's one of my favorites. You want to know, uh, there was actually a, uh, her first debut was a, a solo miniseries. Um, and it's funny because one of the biggest complaints people say is, oh, this is, oh, they, they're getting rid of all the redhead people. Well, I would like to remind you that um, Elsa Bloodstone was originally a blonde, like her dad. And if you look at her first appearance, she was blonde. So the red hair she has now is dyed. Aha! So you can't use that excuse. Anyway, <laughs> um, a good way to learn more about her um, in Next Wave, she was on that team. Matter of fact, her definitive look uh, came from that run. Um, she's also showed up in Marvel Zombies. Another great one, if you really want to learn about her some more, was in um, the... Um, <clears throat> Oh my gosh, the Midnight Suns crossover that was recent that was with, uh, it was written by Donny Cates and Nick Spencer. Um, they did a, uh, where they went to uh, Vegas to get uh, Mephisto. And so a group came together, basically a new Midnight Suns. And it gave us the first time Elsa Bloodstone met Blade. And it's something that I need to see in the MCU because what we find out is that they don't like each other. <laughs> and it's interesting because I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, that would make sense because Elsa fights monsters and Blade fights vampires. So they're both like, <laughs> like you got the easy job. So they're both arguing at each other. And one of my favorite lines Elsa says to Blade, she says, this guy fought, hunts vampires. Like, I don't even see vampires. And Blade's like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you go, that's what I see all the time. I see monsters all the time. Look at us here. <laughs> you know? So they both had that competitive nature. Uh, I knew they were going to get a good uh, Bloodstone actor because um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, a good way to explain Bloodstone, I always tell people, take Buffy and Mary Poppins and combine them together. <laughs> Elsa Bloodstone needs to be ridiculously British. Like tea, crumpets, darling, the whole thing. Like that is a that is the whole thing. She's the proper, she's the proper monster hunter. So she has to have that that Mary Poppins type swag going on there, but also like she can like cut your head off, numerous things like that. And um, another big thing that people were talking about, one of the things that when you Google and some of the pictures you've even included, uh, they had uh, Elsa Bloodstone with the ponytail. That's usually her big thing was she has the long hair and a long ponytail. I'm thinking to myself, why did we not do the ponytail? Once again, this goes to me and how I think. Why did we not do the ponytail? Then I saw the Elsa Bloodstone that they got at, uh, uh, the, at, the, at uh, Avengers Campus. It's a lady with long black hair, and she's wearing that, that specific colored jacket. 
And she has, of course, a few like fake shotguns. And I'm thinking, so that's why we're not doing the ponytail because not everyone could grow hair like that. You know what I'm saying? Not everyone could grow the long ponytail, but you know what they can do is wear that Pico. <laughs> <laughs> this is all merch coming down to merch. Same thing with Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones does not have a costume, but if you take a girl, put her in a leather jacket, get that gray knit thing around her neck, I'm like, oh, that's Jessica Jones. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simplistic nature that uh, so people could cosplay as her and so on and so forth. So uh, I don't know the name of the actor that they got to play Elsa Bloodstone, but she was great. She was fantastic. So Laura Donnelly. Um, yeah, I have to follow. I, I want to tag up on that because um, I did not watch Outlander, uh, but uh, Laura Donnelly was on uh, this HBO show that's probably not coming back for season two, even though it was already renewed for it. The Nevers. A, oh, uh, that's done. <laughs> yeah, the Joss Whedon production. Um, but she was like, she was really good on that. And I ended up interviewing her for it. And like, not to humble brag here a little bit, but you end up talking to a lot of like actors in this line of work and they kind of blend together. I just, I've always recalled her from that interview being incredibly like thoughtful and like really insightful and well spoken. Right. Um, so I would track down any Laura Donnelly interviews you can about. Um, Werewolf by Night, including denofgeek.com. There you go. Dot com slash Marvel, folks. <laughs> you know, it's very easy to put something in black and white and kind of give it like a, as, as we see here, <laughs> like and kind of, you know, put like a period sheen on it, right? But one thing that I thought she brought to this performance was a genuine old-fashioned movie star quality. Like, I can't quite put my finger on it, you know, but it's the kind of thing that, if you were watching this completely out of context, you could believe this was like like somebody in a universal movie from 1947 or something like that. And that's not always an easy thing to do. I feel like a lot of actors, you know, doing period stuff. And a lot of that is the writing and directing as well. Like a lot of times these kind of modern sensibilities and ticks kind of come through. And there was like n almost none of that in Laura Donnelly's performance. Like it was yeah. really a, like a real old Hollywood feel to Elsa Bloodstone, which I thought was really different and really cool. She and Gail or Gael are, are like, they're capital A actors. They're the real deal. And I feel like uh, the, the difference between, you know, uh, average to above average actor and then Gael and Laura Donnelly actor really comes through, particularly in something this short where they have to, you know, rely on the economy of words so much. Absolutely. I also think what fit and helped make all of these uh, people and actors what gave it that old school feel. And one thing I appreciate uh, the director doing was they even included cigarette burns. And if for those <laughs> people that know, yeah, in the old days, um, when film actually, when they were changing the film, you'll see these little things in the corner. They're called cigarette burns, and they let you know that the scene's about to change. I appreciate that because he did not have to do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> he did not have to do that. I tend to pay attention to the little things like that that I appreciate because a lot of people would skip that without knowing that that gives what they're looking at. It makes it feel more alive and so with the cigarette burns and everything like that i really appreciated the look of this whole entire thing by the way tess Kirsten I'm waiting, is laughing. yeah i'm waiting for mike to bring up that we had a, an argument we, <laughs> oh i wonder why they laughed at that no. <laughs> I was like, wait what happened we had an <laughs> argument before i published my review because our task i too called them cigarette burns and, I'm like, they're they're not they cigarette burns. and mike came at me he was like they're called q mark site and I was like, no, they're called cigarette burns. I saw it in the <laughs> Fight Club, Mike. I seen Fight Club. I know they're called friggin' cigarette burns. Jeff Carpenter made a whole, you know, a horror special called cigarette burns. You know, you gonna, you gonna question me? And I ended up going down this huge like rabbit hole. I was on projectionist like Reddit and like forums. And people yeah. were saying that they had and never heard the term cigarette burns before Fight Club. And the Fight Club totally made that up and it wasn't real. And then you had other people fighting them like, well, I was in the 1970s. I was at this <laughs> in Folkestone and I believe we did call them cigarette burns. So, yeah, we had a massive argument. Though. There's still no definitive answer. Is there much? <laughs> 
That the test, you just so- opened up a wound, bro. Like- <laughs> now I got to find out. Now I got to find out. I took a film class, okay? <laughs> they told me it was cigarette burns. It was in a book. Right. <laughs> so it was probably one of those old, like, insult town jargon that they yeah. had that has gone away. And I'm pretty sure there's a, a actual term for it. But that was what I was told. I was told they were called cigarette burns. Well, me too. All right, look, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Like, by the way, folks, the Jack Kirby Museum is here. And full disclosure, I am a trustee of the Jack Kirby Museum. And you should absolutely head to kirbymuseum.org and check out our mission to make sure that Jack Kirby becomes the household name that he deserves to be. uh, And also to uh, hopefully one day establish a permanent Jack Kirby Museum on the Lower East Side, uh, hopefully around Delancey Street, near where Jack Kirby was born. The real life Yancey Street for you Ben Grimm fans out there. Any minute now, Andrew's going to tell me that we're running long and we better get She-Hulk. But before we do, what do we think? Is there is there more to come with this corner of the MCU? Yes. I called it during WandaVision. And WandaVision, they introduced us to the dark hole. I said, oh, yes. So that's where we're going. And people are like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's all I posted was like, oh, we get in a dark hole. Okay, that's where we're going. And people are like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Um, Pretty much everything that goes bump in the night in the Marvel universe came from the dark hole. Vampires, werewolves, ghosts, all of that came from the dark hole. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, that was like one of the main reasons the Midnight Suns came together in the first place. The dark hole had gotten released and they had to go fix it and they had to go fight it. So when I saw the dark hole, I was like, oh, we're about to get into weird stuff now. We're, we're going to get into Legion of Monsters. And that, that also leads to another theory that I have that um, we will eventually get a Midnight Suns team. Um, I'm thinking they're going to go with Spirits of Vengeance Instead, for two reasons. One, it's, it, you know, the Suns part, they're going to have women in the team. So they can't really go that route unless they go <laughs> Suns, S-U-N-S. So, but I'm thinking Spirits of Vengeance because also it has Vengeance in it and that relates to Avengers. Mm. So that's something I'm also uh, thinking, and if this is true, you heard it here first. I'm, I'm thinking Agatha, Agatha joins that team. I think that this story and everything that's going on in here is going to continue there as well. And we're just going to explore this whole side of monster and witchcraft in this whole corner of Marvel that exists. I mean, like, look, I know obviously we're getting a Blade movie and I know Feige like has apparently has big plans for Ghost Rider. But personally, like I would almost rather see this corner of the MCU unfold on TV because there's so much to explore there. You know, like, give me like a 70s grindhousey Ghost Rider Halloween special next or something, you know, like, that's kind of stuff that I want to see. But nice. I would like for Marvel to make uh, more, take more chances like this, especially since they've proven that they can do so. Uh, Going off with Ghost Rider, not exactly a grindhouse, but I would love a Western. Ooh. Let me get a Western. There's a whole Western side of Marvel. Two Gun Kid. Blazing Saddles, um, Red Wolf. These are all, um, you know, uh, uh, like a Western area of of Marvel. And um, what a great way to introduce Ghost Rider because there's Spirit Rider who was officially before recently the first Ghost Rider ever. He dressed in all white. And then we also have Kushala, uh, Happy Indigenous People Day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have Kushala who was the Spirit Rider also who's a Native American woman. Um, these are stories that can all be told and what a way to kind of tie everything and include this corner of Marvel that is horror. Cause that's something that also struck my attention was that when you look up Werewolf by Night and Disney Plus, you know, they have the categories. The category they have there is horror. And so I'm like, okay, they're definitely gonna be making more of these. Yeah. Because they're not gonna do all that just for this one thing. I have yeah, so I have another point on werewolf because I also don't. I mean, I don't really feel like moving on to She Hulk. <laughs> 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 um, I I just I want to commend uh, Marvel on its like on its excellent use of corpses lately because <laughs> my favorite part of Doctor Strange 
was the final act with featured a hero as a reanimated corpse. And in this one, the animatronic Ulysses Bloodstone body oh God. is so cool. It's just so creepy and cool, but in a way that is not necessarily kid friendly, but also not completely traumatizing. 100%. It just reminds me of like this. This is definitely something I would have seen when I was a kid and would have thought was like scary and weird and interesting, but also, you know, wouldn't have completely ruined my life, I think. <laughs> I think it's time to hit She-Hulk. So let's uh, play Somewhere Over the Rainbow. (laughs) And now we're in color. (laughs) I had the strangest dream. We haven't done Marvel Stand-Up in a couple weeks, and we came back just in time for She-Hulk to become the show that I always hoped it was going to be. Task. Look, man, one of the things one of the things that we love about you is like you get behind the MCU the way like I get behind the New York Mets, like like <laughs> good, bad, like it doesn't matter. Right. Like uh, we can be a little bit more critical and we've been a little lukewarm on She-Hulk from time to time. Like there have been episodes that I really haven't liked. There have been episodes where I'm like, OK, I see what they're doing here this week, even without Daredevil. Right. Like we could take Daredevil out of that episode this is the She-Hulk show that I thought we were getting from the jump. I loved it. Like, I was so happy to finally just be, like, all in, like, from credits to credits on an episode of She-Hulk because I've been rooting for this show. So you came you came on on the right episode, dude, because it might have been, <laughs> been rough otherwise. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I just want to say, uh, not my daredevil, hashtag, not my daredevil, he <laughs> smiled. <laughs> <laughs> um cracked a joke um and 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 he got some and that's not my life none of that i don't smile um uh, i don't do any of these things i can't relate to daredevil at all now look matt is catholic at least he felt bad about getting some so- he always feels bad he always feels bad afterwards yeah like- <laughs> he'll punish himself later <laughs> um is there a run of show for this part of the episode? Sorry, folks, <laughs> I've lost control of Marvel Standom once again. Kirsty, you have been perhaps the most critical of She-Hulk of all of us. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> don't apologize. <laughs> but I'm sorry. did this one win you over? I thought this episode was terrific. Yeah, um, Cody Ziegler, great writer. Just, um, he was on this episode. He made just a... Just a phenomenal uh, good time, just thrilling. The action was great. The jokes landed. Um, yeah, I just thought it was, I just, it just ticked along nicely. And then at the end, it was just a really devastating moment that I felt was really earned. Um, I was thinking, like, you know, because it goes from her sleeping with Matt after sleeping with Josh, you know, and, and then, you know, that video comes on and, and they call her a slut and whatever. And I was thinking, you know, you know, was I thinking that, like, is that some ingrained misogyny in me that before that video came up, was I thinking, wow, she really gets around, you know? And then I was like, no, I don't think that is what it was. I think it was pure envy. Like mm-hmm. when I was in my younger years, I really wish I was uh, earning like six figures and just getting that much quality dick. And <laughs> I just felt very envious. Um, Look, a guy who can hear your heartbeat is going to know what to do. <laughs> he was dirty macking, man. That's for my hood. That's what we call. We call that dirty macking. Like, ah, oh, you. <laughs> like when a guy has trouble getting a girl, and he has that one line that he knows is going to work. That's the dirty <laughs> mac, and he knew it. Like, I can hear your heartbeat. I said, oh, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear heartbeats. I can't stand a chance. Listen, Feige, I'm mad at you. Are you going to bring Matt Murdock and Namor into the MCU at the same time? Can I have a wife? Can, can, can I, have I see women? what the problem is. Can, can, we, can I have some women's? Can I? You know, like, <laughs> like I, all my time on is, oh, Matt, oh, Namor, oh, Matt. Come on. <laughs> oh, man thing. <laughs> no, Ted. Ted, yeah. no justice for ted hashtag <laughs> anyway Kirsty, i'm sorry continue yeah, sorry just oh no i was done i mean 
<laughs> she dropped the mic after she said dick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, just then I was thinking, you know, Andrew's going to be going back and forth over whether to cut that bit out of the VOD. And um, don't do it, Andrew. I stand by it. We're still yeah. we're still P, we're still on the PG-13 end of this episode, I think. I think we're OK. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't said fuck yet, have I? Oh, there's no. the one oh! episode. <laughs> like, <laughs> Kirsty, I don't think that's internalized misogyny. I just think that's because you've never seen a Marvel superhero have sex before. Yes. <laughs> like, well, by, and, by the I Marvel saw, standards, I like Eternals. she is. I was like, say Eternals. absolutely. The, yeah, like, the fact that she's had sex twice makes her just an unbelievable slut. Yeah. But. Here's the thing. Yeah, we can qualify this with Eternals. Like that Eternals sex scene was so chaste. Like that was not a sex scene. Nobody, nobody was satisfied in that sex scene. Whereas <laughs> Jen looks at the camera and makes it very clear. <laughs> like <laughs> my man, hey, hey, my my dude, Daredevil. You know, he he does his thing and then leaves. What mm-hmm. made this important to me was that he did that to Jen, and not She Hulk. I think that that mm-hmm. was important because, you know, one of the reasons why I love She-Hulk is, you know, we all have identity issues at times sometimes, and we wish that we were something, you know, better. And I love how in one of the episodes, she says, well, I can actually become that. I can actually, you know, like, you know, you see the cool person, you know, we see shows like this all the time, going back to Urkel, you know what I'm saying? Like, Urkel and Stefan. That's pretty much Jennifer and (laughs) She-Hulk. Like, you have the nerdy little geek girl who's the lawyer, and then she becomes this awesome character, and she gains more confidence, and she's trying to find the balance between being her real self and being She-Hulk to the point where she she even wonders which one is really her. One of my favorite um, uh, uh, issues of Avengers that I never read um, was when Captain America <laughs> was talking to She-Hulk and, you know, she was talking all big and Captain America says there, when was the last time you've turned to the gym? And she had to think and she was like, I-, I don't even remember. And like, he said, can you turn back for me? And like, when she turned back, like she just, her mind got clearer again. And she was like, wow, I'm like becoming addicted to being She-Hulk. And I'm feeling like in the future, we're going to be exploring more of that. I could definitely see that, especially from the final scene of this episode. Can anybody remind me, though, real quick, where did things leave off with Karen in Daredevil season three? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I can't I don't remember. But, you know, all I'm going to say is that Matt's Matt's in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> Matt is for the world. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a tie down man at all <laughs> and in Daredevil's defense it's because all his girlfriends either go crazy or bullseye kills them <laughs> so he like has attachment issues like he's kind of like oh you're still here my bad <laughs> like usually they go away somehow <laughs> I don't know how but yeah so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to touch on that I hope they do at least um, they haven't even established if the Netflix shows are even considered canon. My response to that all the time is, who cares? Who cares? The, whether they're canon or not, who cares? It, as long as the stories are there, you can watch them, you enjoy them. I don't need for it to tie into the MCU proper stuff. That's just me, though. Exactly. I mean, my theory is, like, yes, they are canon. But that doesn't mean they have to talk about them. You know, like you're reading Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil right now. It's not like every other issue that he's like referencing Frank Miller's Daredevil. You know what I mean? Like, like it doesn't like this is an expansive enough universe. It's there. It's backstory. Like it happened. Like doesn't mean that every time he shows up, like, look, I know you were saying like, you know, he was smiling too much and making too many jokes and, and, and getting too much, but not like, my Daredevil. <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> but, it, but it's exactly like the right thing for his appearance here. And it is funnier and cooler because we know the context, you know, of the, the, the previous shows and the, and the tone of that of that show, you know. So, like, I'm cool with whatever they want to do. If I was going to complain about one thing and I understand why they did it, 
But like when Born Again hits, like there was a little too much. There was a little too much like CGI Daredevil for me. That's necessary sometimes. And of course, it's necessary for, for Spidey and everything else. But like what those shows did so well, like that first Daredevil hallway fight is still just like unmatched in, in like Marvel, like in like MCU history, as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. When this show comes back for real, like I want practical Daredevil all the time. You know, and I did like the hallway thing in this. It was fun. <laughs> I didn't even think they were going to do that. I didn't even think they were going to do that, but I really, really appreciated it. Um, <clears throat> just to go off of what you said, and I agree, um, while I'm okay with him doing flips, uh, it was jarring. I will openly admit to that. I appreciate it. But then again, also, I had to think, this is She-Hulk show. So when, let's take it to comics. When Daredevil, the Daredevil comics are very serious, very, very serious. He'll crack a joke every now and then, but it's 100% serious. But when he's on a She-Hulk comic, there's going to be more comedy involved. There's going to probably be even more superheroics. So I'm perfectly okay with seeing a version, because there's so many different versions of, of Matt Murdock Daredevil, one that is more placed more playful, more swashbuckling, more flipping. But I feel like they're going to go the more serious undertone once Born again drops. And I feel like the original vision for Daredevil when sort of, well, the vision when sort of Miller took over was that, you know, Matt was a sweetheart. He was a Christian and, but he was on the streets. He was, he was kicking people's asses. And so they deliberately created people around him, the villains for his comics to be just the worst people imaginable. You know, Kingpin is horrific. Bullseye is horrific. And, and it was really to make Matt look like basically as not as much of a villain as he could have been if he was in any other of the sort of mainline comics at the time. So um, I feel like, you know, they can have a fun Matt Murdock, but the villains have still got hit uh, in Born Again um, for that to work really well. So I think that's, that's my, my, um, my prediction is that the villains will still be completely messed up <laughs> just so that they can make Matt's whole thing work, even if he is a more upbeat character this time around. Uh, I just think it's interesting that the MCU is old enough now that it's going through these kind of philosophical questions that like you comic readers have dealt with like, you know, decades ago of like, <laughs> you know, like we have the same character in a new story played by the same actor. Like what, how should we be concerned about the continuity? And the answer, I, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but what most comic book readers tell you would be like, you're not worried about the continuity. Like, it's just like this weird gray area. Like, you know, it's the same guy. It's the same person. They're having different adventures. You bring the canon that you want to bring to it. You, you bring the stuff that you read to it. Um, that's just what you have to do when things get this old and like long in the tooth. We're pushing, what, two decades now with this? With Marvel movies? 14 years. 14 yeah. years. Um, so the, uh, I think Matt Murdock might be the first in a long line of characters that movie and TV fans have these kind of philosophical canon questions about. Um, and like it's, it's, it's you comic folks' um, job to educate them <laughs> and just assure them there's not a problem. <laughs> I like your answer, though. Just like whatever you want it to be. Sure. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's like Daredevil fans. Let me tell you, you guys won. You won. You wanted Jerry Cox back. You got him back. Do you know how many movements are out there to bring something back, to do this, release this? You guys actually won. <laughs> you guys actually, someone actually looked and said, okay, <laughs> to you guys, and you got it. Don't ruin it now. <laughs> you got it. Now they're like, okay, well, now I want to know when this happens, when this happened, when this, who cares? Right. You have Charlie Cox back. He's here. We can finally get Daredevil and Spider-Man live action. I'm going to warn everybody when that inevitably happens, you're not going to hear the end of it from me. When I see Daredevil and Spider-Man live action together flipping around, I'm losing it in the theater. They're going to have to carry my big self out. I don't know how they're going to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm excited to see 
Daredevil and Matt in more situations in the MCU. I'm here for it. I mean, I'm a massive, massive Daredevil fan, and I don't want to belabor the canon and continuity point too much um, more than I already have. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that the test is going to be because season three of Daredevil did, a, did an excellent extended bullseye origin. Yes. Um, like really, and I, I'm, I'm blanking on the actor's name right now, but he was great and it did a great job and it took all season to get that character there. And it was cool and it was like a little tragic and it was interesting. Like whatever they do with Bullseye, even if they have to recast, you know, because, you know, look, people's schedules are what they are. But I feel like Bullseye might be the tell as to as to how Marvel really feels about, you know, uh, about the, the canon slash continuity elements between the Netflix shows and these. But my gut feeling is, is that it's all there and it all happened. And if it didn't, so be it. Whether they do it or not, it really doesn't change anything. Those stories did not go away just because they decided to be canon or not. And that's something I always got to preach to people. <clears throat> especially people who say, oh, I don't like how things are done now. I don't like how this is. Okay, that's fine. All that old stuff is still there. It, it never went away. So you can always go back and watch and appreciate it. So that's just what I'm hoping what people take out of this. I do feel a little bad that we're spending all this time talking about Daredevil because this uh, was a, <laughs> well, because this was a great She-Hulk episode. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, it really, really was. It really captured everything I like about the character, about the comics. It genuinely made me laugh more than once. And as Kirsty pointed out, it has like a like a really moving, tragic ending there, you know? So, and it also drops a pretty big MCU bombshell in the fact that the Sokovia Accords have been repealed. <laughs> Why are you laughing maniacally? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just I know like, because I can do whatever I want now. <laughs> I know people that think the Sokovia Accords are the most boring part of the MCU that ever existed. So I, I just like that they got every time they get a mention, I I get a little thrill that they're <laughs> they're back. You know, they just <laughs> the bureaucracy. The, <laughs> the bureaucracy. I've Hobie records returns once more. <laughs> I feel like we've made clear that we are extremely pro red tape on on Marvel's. Yes, <laughs> Alec like... is the bureaucracy enjoyer, <laughs> and this yeah. episode gave you a lot of it. Like, like we got like deep into superhuman law on this, Alex. So, like, you must have you must have been like really in your shit here. Like, oh, yeah. like... <laughs> this was great, man. I mean, like. Uh... I, I I've been the the shield defender this whole time, and, but even my my faith had waned <laughs> prior to the episode eight. Um, and I, if you guys have keen eared listeners will notice we've not even mentioned episode seven, which we promised we would have talked about, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, episode it's it's superb. Like the more they get into the weeds with like. Um, there's really extended universe stuff. Like the more obscure the villains are, the more uh, personal the in jokes are, the more boring the red tape is. I just feel like <laughs> the better this show is. Um, I, I really I enjoyed um, Daredevil and She Hulk kind of having like a philosophical dialogue of like, well, I would like to approach this from a stealth perspective. And I would like to approach this from a smash perspective. Um, <laughs> and it's just kind of fun to see those interplay. Uh, and that, that's also the moment where it becomes canon that goons and henchmen are completely different animals. Oh my God, that was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I texted Kirsty when that happened. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Maybe the most important canonical thing that's ever happened in a Disney Plus Marvel show. <laughs> um yeah, it's just like when this show does it right, it does it right. Like I, I just, it's it's attention to detail, almost always pans out. It just like you can get the sense that even when an, an episode is not really working that well, that at least there was a thoughtful writers room conversation around it. Agreed. Um, and the addition of Daredevil this week, plus the gala, um, I just it had a lot going on, and it it was able to work. I agree. I, I like that She Hulk. Pretty much take down, took down Daredevil pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because 
you know, I used to help run a comic book shop <clears throat> and somebody would tell me sometimes they'd be like, man, I want to get into comics, but I don't like when the superheroes are forced into these events. They're forced to do all these things. I always tell people, read Daredevil. <laughs> because Daredevil stays out of all that stuff. Like, he's <laughs> like, look, man, I'm going to smoke this. I'm a guy. <laughs> and I'm blind. Like, I can't go up against hoax. I can't go up against these things. I stay out of it. <laughs> and this is why. Right when he got involved, he got pretty much taken out. <laughs> and like, he's like, yep, yeah, this is why. I just stick to <laughs> to what I do on the side. But when he is in these situations like this, it's awesome to see him get out of it. But he really just prefers stealth. <laughs> that's just his that's just his lane. There's there's a thing on the run of show that says Easter eggs, and I prepared nothing for Easter eggs, folks. <laughs> so help me out here. Like <laughs> She Hulk being sneaky, adding mutants, more and more mutants into the MCU. We got um we got a mystery mortal. Uh, he showed up. He's a mutant. And also El Aguilar, the dude with the sword. He's a mutant. Um, I see them throwing in and slowly sneaking in mutants into the MCU. And they're using She-Hulk for a lot of that. We got another Wolverine joke this episode. Yes, we did. <laughs> uh, Feige was hired. How he even started doing all of this. He was hired to do X-Men number one. In the first X-Men movie, his job was just to be the comic book guy. Uh, that was his job. Was just I, If we need to reference the comics, we go to this guy. Uh, it turns out the director, who's, who we won't name, I'll talk about, um, <laughs> he did not want any comic books on the set. He didn't want none on the set. He wanted nothing to do with them. That's why they don't look like the X-Men. That's why they had a completely different look, some different attitudes. He never read an X-Men book in his life. So Foggy was the dude that was sneaking comics on set. So him and Hugh Jackman had has always had a good relationship. I've been telling people for years, dude, we're going to get Wolverine. And it might be Hugh because he was never able to work with Foggy in the MCU. And that was something that he's always wanted to do. So. When it comes to mutants, I know that Feige has a story he wants to tell, and he's slowly slipping them in every now and then. So pay attention to all these people that are at it, because you might see a new mutant. Andrew was asking about a Red Hulk joke. Did I miss a Red Hulk reference? Yeah, uh, she said, uh, she was she was naming off, what do you want to see? Is this one, you want to see a Red Hulk? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, she just threw that out there. I have a theory about Red Hulk, too. Rest in peace, William Hurt. Um, my theory is I think they're going to bring Liv Tyler back. They've brought back everybody else from the Hulk movies. Mm. They brought each and every one of them back. Uh, they could bring Liv in, and Liv could be like, well, I'm going to take over where my dad was doing. You know, I'm going to take over. And then she could become Red She-Hulk. Or we could just call her Red Hulk. And uh, she could be the one, maybe a bad guy for the next movie. But uh, it would definitely have to be Betsy. We got to get Betsy in here somewhere, somewhere and somehow. Maybe she's in the intelligentsia. I like how you had the Red She-Hulk pictures available. Anything else before we sign off today? One last thing. Uh, I want to take it back to Werewolf by Night a little bit. Um, Something that, uh, you know, Thor Love and Thunder came out. And uh, I enjoyed it. A lot of people, I don't know how you guys felt about it. A lot of people didn't didn't really care for it. Um, I know that it's different, but um, one of the things they did was gore didn't look like gore in the comic books. And I know a lot of people were upset about that. But in the beginning of Werewolf by Night, there's a bunch of drawings of Slade monsters in the background. And one of the mon- Slade monsters looks like gore. Yes. From the books. Like one of them looked like that. And then everyone blew up my 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 mentions like, look, they could have done it. They could have done it this way. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, Marvel, why'd you guys do that? <laughs> I can't defend it now because you guys <laughs> had an idea in your head. <laughs> and now I can't defend it. But that's the last Easter egg I saw. Task, before we say goodbye, where can folks find you? Hey, it's your boy Task. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Up to Task, and also on TikTok, uh, where I am way too old to be on there. I feel <laughs> like, but that's fine. You know, I, I feel like I'm the dude. I'm I'm not too old for life, just too old for TikTok. 
I don't know. I, that's how I feel. But anyways, I'm on TikTok up to task. Uh, I have a podcast. Type in Super Suit Show, all one word on Google. You'll find everything and just holler at me. Talk to me. I talk back. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> Tess, thank you for joining us, man. I really hope you come back. Hey, I had a blast, man. Thank you guys all for having me. That is a wrap on this week's Marvel Standom, folks. Make sure you're subscribing to us wherever you're watching or listening right now. Um, reminder, for any of you who might be listening to us on a podcast platform and not watching live on Twitch, there's a video version of this show. You can have fun with us live. We're at twitch.tv slash denageektv uh, most Thursdays. Uh, don't forget to check out our web home of denigeek.com where you can find all our Marvel coverage. Go straight to denigeek.com slash Marvel for that. Drop us a line. Let us know your burning questions, what you want us to cover in upcoming episodes. You can do that by following Marvel Standom. That's at Marvel Standom on Twitter and Instagram. Give those a follow. Send your hate mail there. Whatever you want to do, we're here for you. Don't forget, we also have a DC show, so check out DC Standom where you can on all major podcast platforms. And if you came in late to this broadcast, don't worry. You'll be able to watch this entire episode on denigeek.com or at our YouTube home. That's Denigeek US. I got to change that. I know, I know, I know. Don't get at me. Uh, don't forget, you can check out past episodes there as well and also wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to Andrew Halley, the best producer in any corner of the multiverse, who, by the way just worked all weekend at New York Comic Con with me and is completely wiped out and is still here making this show look awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks to Denny Geek social media coordinator, Lee Parham, for keeping everyone in line in the comments, but not today, because he has the day off, because he also worked all weekend at New York Comic Con. Comic -Con. But you should follow our TikTok. We're at Denny Geek TV. Lee does great work over there, folks. Special shout out to Michael R for making the podcast version of this show all it can be. But most of all, thank you all for watching, listening, following, subscribing. You know the drill. This has been Marvel Standom on the Denny Geek Network. Until next time, remember, folks, we stand together.